continuing our study through First Peter this morning. Lubaya Ganaskevsky was a Christian in the former Soviet Union. And during the time of the Soviets, she was arrested for being a Christian, for being expressive of her faith, gathering together in a secret church. And so she was, as she was arrested, she was uh, asked to give up the names of those who were in, in her church. And part of that involved torture. It involved nightly beatings during the day, starving. She was put in solitary confinement so that when she felt like it, she could give up those names. Well, she refused. And each night a man would come in with a whip and beat her. And night after night after night, this went on. And as she started to wear down, get tired, she determined that this night, tonight, I'm going to speak to my captor. I'm going to speak to my abuser and tell him he is a criminal. She prepared her heart for that, and as the door opened and he came in, whip in hand, she saw him a little bit differently. It was like a voice in her head told her, he also is suffering. You are tired of beatings, he is tired of doing the beating. You are desperate to get out of this situation, he is desperate for you to give up the information. You are tired from a lack of sleep, he also is tired from a lack of sleep. He's walking through the same valley of tears that you are walking through. And it was as though this voice in her head told her to do something different. And so as the man came with the whip in hand and he raised it once again to beat her, she looked up at him and smiled. Well, that caught his eye. Why are you smiling? He asked her. She said, because I, I see you not as you would see yourself in a mirror, but I see you as you once were. You were a beautiful, innocent child. We are about the same age. You could have been a playmate of mine. But I also see you as I hope you will be. There's a man in the Bible who persecuted Christians whose name was Saul. He found Jesus and he became an apostle, one who shared the good news of Jesus with others. And that's what I, I hope for you. The man with the whip lowered it a little bit. And she asked him this question, what kind of burden is on you that would cause you to beat someone night after night who's done no harm to you? He didn't have an answer. But that man left that cell that night, a changed man. How is it that Christians can endure suffering, sometimes torture, ridicule, and still return kindness and grace? I invite you to take your copy of the scriptures and turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to be looking this morning at 1 Peter 3, verses 8 to 17. If you are willing and able, I would ask that you would stand in honor of God's word, as we read this this morning. Please follow along as I read 1 Peter 3, 8 to 17. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you are called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always be being prepared to make an offense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ might be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. 
This is the word of the Lord. Every word of God proves true. You may be seated. Here in this passage, I think Peter is helping us to see that when we face suffering and evil, we should choose good. That's easy to say. It's hard to do. So as we dive into this passage this morning, would you join me in asking God's spirit to help us as we open this up and that we would conform to what his word says to us and about us. Father, thank you for this message from Peter. We ask, Father, that as we go through trials and tribulations, suffering and evil, difficulties, reviling, slander, in this life, that you would help us to live changed lives because of who we are in Christ, looking to him as both our example and our hope. By your spirit, would you teach us this morning how we should live in the light of suffering, especially for suffering, for doing good. In the name of that Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, as a means of introduction, we've kind of been looking the last several times at how Peter has taught us uh, to live out chapter 2, verse 12, that we should keep our conduct among those who don't know Jesus honorable so that they may see our good works and glorify God on the day of visitation. Peter started with the realm of the civil government, the emperor, those who are rulers and authorities. He then moved to the workplace, slaves and masters or employers, employees, and we see the interaction. And in both of those cases, he talked about unjust things happening. Certainly the emperor was unjust. You may have been in a business situation where you were treated unfairly. And then last time we talked about how Peter brings it into the home. How is the home, the, the relationship between wives and husbands, also a display, especially if you live in a home where a husband or a wife doesn't know Christ and is not following him. How do we live in a way so that they see our good works and glorify God? And now he broadens it back out a little bit more and he talks to the whole church. Take a look at verse 8. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. As believers, we face a whole lot of different issues. One of the things that Christ accomplished at the cross was to bring people together from all sorts of different backgrounds and ethnicities, genders, political leanings, etc. That, that gather together. If you look around the room this morning, you will probably not see the people that you plan your life to be with. However, look at what God has done. He has brought many different people from many different backgrounds, much history together. With that comes many different views, comes different giftings, comes different methods for resolving conflict, viewpoints on politics or sexuality or relationships. We are a group that Christ has brought together. And in that, how do we live? Well, Peter gives us a couple of things here in verse 8 to tell us how we should live so that the world is able to see who he is through us. He tells us about our need for unity of mind and heart. Because we're one unified body, we need to have unity of mind. What is it that brings us together? Certainly not everybody is thinking the same thing and the same priorities, but we have a unity of mind. That means our priorities, our attention, our affection for all of us in the body of Christ is on Jesus. Right? We have a lot of different things going on. Different people do things differently, but we have one similar thing that we think of as the top priority in our lives. Now, that doesn't mean that we are all coming together and saying the same words, chanting the same thing. Sometimes I think we do that. But let me tell you the difference between unison and harmony. Or let me show you on this video clip. So I wanted to demonstrate a little bit of the difference between unison and harmony with Beyond Steels and my sister. So we're just going to check it out and you guys should just mess up. Alright. As the deep and flow, the water so my soul I'll give that to thee. Now we're going to harmony. You alone are my heart's desire and I long 
to worship thee. That is beautiful. And so it is in the body of Christ. It is beautiful. Not that we all think the exact same, not that we are all exactly the same, but did you see what, what happened in that clip? They sang the same song. They stayed in the same key. They, there were things that they were a priority. We didn't have somebody just floating off doing their own thing. That's the unison of it, the unity of it. And then the beautiful harmony as we bring many things, as God brings many things together, different giftings, different ideas, different ways to handle things. It is a beautiful, beautiful picture. But what undermines unity of mind? It's usually our selfishness. A big hurdle is that our own nature pulls against our unity of mind. We want things our way. We've been brought here, but we think we are right. And we want everybody else to think the same way that we do. And that's why at the end of the verse, I think Peter adds a humble mind. That's the attitude with which we come to unity of mind with humility. We are willing to share what God has done in our lives, what we know, what we can give. But we also need to be ready and willing to learn. Not demanding our ways, but when correction is needed, we do it in a humble manner. I think this is what Paul was talking about when he wrote to Timothy. And he said this, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. Able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. This is a humble mind. Not only does Peter talk about our need to have unity of mind, but unity of heart. He uses these words, he talks about sympathy, you know, caring for one another with real compassion, not just from the heart, not just from words, but with real action. He also talks about brotherly love, which we've looked at earlier in Peter. This is the type of familial love, the, the, the love that comes together, though we are from different families, though we're from different backgrounds, we come together and we love each other because of the brotherly love that God's building up within us. I. Howard Marshall says this, the ideal Christian community is one which produces between people who have no blood ties the same bonds of affection as are expected between brothers and sisters. Just in talking to some of you, you have experienced that love here. You have experienced the type of love that doesn't look at who you have been, doesn't look at maybe where you are socio socioeconomically, economically, but looks at you and loves you. Some of you have experienced great love here. And he says we should have tender hearts. Hearts that are soft to one another, not detached or unfeeling, but that actually really care, kind, compassionate, other-centered hearts. And the reason for this is that we are a new people. We have been given a new life in Christ. 1 Peter 1, which we looked at a while back, says, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from the heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. It is because of Jesus that we have unity of mind and unity of heart. And now this should be true of us as believers when we go to our homes, when we gather together at church, when we're out in the community, when we go to school, when we go to our workplace, when we pray and serve and study God's word together, sharing the good news of Jesus. That sounds great. Let's do that. All right, we can just stop now. But we all know we don't live in a vacuum. We probably have enough room here if everybody wants to bring their cots and we can gather together, but we don't live in a vacuum. We live in a real world. And the real world that Peter lived in, that he was calling these exiles to, to live in unity of mind and unity of heart, was a world in which suffering and evil are part of their life. And now for the rest of this letter, Peter is going to have that as the backdrop. How do we live the truth about us, that we have been rescued by God, that we have an inheritance in heaven, that he is our all in all, that he gave us the, gave us the example, that he gave us the method by which we can become one. How do we live like that in a world where we suffer, where there is evil? 
truth is that believers will face suffering and evil. Believers will face suffering and evil. Peter does not live in a fancy world where everything is happy, happy, happy. There's an expectation of suffering. Look at verse 9. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. These are two things that Peter is expecting the church to run into. Peter mentions evil and reviling as those hurdles. Evil is the absence of good. All the things we just talked about are good. Evil is the absence of those. Rather than a unified and humble heart, it comes from a proud and selfish heart. Excuse me, proud and selfish mind. And rather than a, a unified heart, it comes from a hard and selfish heart. Reviling this word, we don't usually use that a lot. So reviling is using harsh language. It can be abusive language, cursing, insulting. Peter says, expect this, but don't return it with reviling. Jesus tells us where this reviling, where this evil comes from. In Luke 6, 45, Jesus says, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance or the overflow of the mouth, his heart speaks. Why is reviling coming out? Because it is the overflow of an evil heart. And Peter alludes to what this is supposed to cause in this passage as well. Why would people revile us? Why would people speak down? Why would people talk badly about Christians who do good things? Because it's meant for intimidation and fear. It's meant to marginalize, to minimize, to remove or silence Christians or Christian thought from the conversation. And friends, how often do we pull back ourselves so that we could fit in, so that we don't suffer evil or reviling? And so we choose to pull out of the conversation and let that fear win. Reviling is mentioned again later in verse 16, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. What is often said about somebody, especially in our culture, matters. You see, news reports, something happens about something to someone else and their name is now drugged under the mud forever. Reviling, slander. Peter expects there to be slander and hurtful things. If you think that Christians are uniquely under attack, Today or over the last several years or a decade or whatever, understand that that is very rare. This is the norm. Suffering. This is the norm. Slander. Insult. When we share the gospel with people, we don't often say, oh, and if you follow Jesus, you're going to be rejected, slandered, insulted. But Peter is very clear to the church, this is our norm. Why does the world hate us? Because it hated Jesus. It hates righteousness. It hates being compared to someone who is living according to God's way. It hates to be exposed in its own sin. The world is under the enemy's sway. And so we will continue to suffer as we belong to God and as we do good things. That's not a happy message. That's not a yahoo. All right, let's go do it. But there's hope. And there's reason why we can have hope. Suffering is a believer. Suffering as a believer is to be expected. The question is, how will we respond as exiles? How will we respond while we sojourn here in this life, when we have said no to the world, said yes to God, and yet we are awaiting coming to him? The same way that we are to walk humbly, in our hearts and in our minds with each other, we should walk in the light of suffering in the same way. We don't just simply turn the switch on and off when we come in here. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we leave this place and we have nothing to do with God for the rest of the week. We come on Sunday morning and we flip the switch. Here I am. I'm, I'm, I'm spiritual. I'm holy. But we should display a true faith as we live consistent lives throughout the, world, throughout the week. How does a changed heart respond to suffering and evil? I think Peter gives us 10 things. We're going to do them very briefly this morning. 
10 things that we learned from this passage on how we respond to suffering. First off, we don't respond with sin. We don't respond with sin. We're not to be surprised at suffering, but we're also not to go looking for trouble either. Verse 9 tells us not to repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. It's easy to want to do this. It's easy to, to get back at someone who has caused us hurt or caused us harm. We want to defend ourselves. We want to be the one who is in the right. We don't like suffering. And oftentimes we want those who, suffer, who cause us suffering to suffer themselves. But that's not how someone who has put their trust in Christ should respond. A believer who's hoping Jesus recognizes their own sin. And that temptation to respond in that way, it turns from it. A believer in Jesus believes that justice will be accomplished by God. And so they entrust themselves to God's plan for their lives, which includes trials, tribulations, and struggles. A believer whose hope is in Jesus has an eternal perspective on momentary suffering. The quote I read said, when we have that eternal perspective for momentary suffering, our momentary suffering is like a scratch on a penny of a millionaire. What we have coming is so much greater than the time, the momentary suffering that we have. A believer in Jesus doesn't respond with evil because like God hates evil, so does a follower of Jesus. And so our first thing is we don't respond to evil because the Lord's face is against those who do evil, both for those who initiate it and those who respond with it. Second thing, bless those who mistreat you. Verse 9 continues, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called. You were called to bless in light of evil and reviling, that you may obtain a blessing. To bless here. It's a word that means to speak well of or to eulogize. When you have someone eulogize a person who has passed away, most of all the time it is good words, isn't it? We don't talk about those bad things that they did. We, we say nice things about them. In the same way, this word, we are called to bless. The blessing a Christian might give someone who is doing evil towards them or reviling them might be finding ways to serve them. To pray for their salvation or for their spiritual progress. To accept, express thankfulness for them. To speak well of them. And to desire their well-being. That's hard. That's hard to do. But rather than responding with sin, we are called to bless. Number three, watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. Verse 10, who desire, whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. You might remember this passage, this, this verse, uh, actually 10 verses 10 to 12 are a quote from Psalm 34, which we studied in the first series that, that I was here with you. But just as the mouths of the, as the, of the righteous bring uh, good things out of their mouth, the wicked bring evil from their heart, which one should we be? Watch your mouth. The mouth of the born-again believer should overflow with good. Guard the words that you say. Be slow to speak. Be quick to listen. Stop talking if you need to stop talking. We were just talking at men's breakfast yesterday morning about that. Sometimes we say things and they get out of our mouth and we can't take them back. You can't take back those words. If you need to stop and do some evaluation, Stop talking. Just pause. But guard the words that you say. Peter and the, and the writer of Psalm 34, David also tell us to speak the truth. Don't let your lips speak deceit. In the middle of suffering or trouble, it's easy to, to blame. It's easy to exaggerate. Oh, you never do this. You always do this. You hate me. You don't care about these things at all. We make things up. We, we lie sometimes to cover ourselves, sometimes to make the other person look bad. We shade the truth with our, with our words. And then we compare offenses. Well, yes, I did that, but what you did was so much worse. 
Guard your tongue. Guard your lips. Watch your mouth. Number four, do good. Verse 11 tells us to let him turn away from evil and do good. In the face of suffering, doing good may seem out of place and unjust. We feel that our rights have been violated. And therefore, for us to be expected to do good, that seems way out of place. So what would Peter tell us in that thinking? He would tell us, look at Jesus. Jesus is our example. We saw this in chapter 2 and we talked about it. That Jesus came down to where we were when we were hating him. When we were living for ourselves. When we reviled him. He came down to us. He experienced the betrayal and the denial even by his closest friends. And while he was being tortured and murdered on the cross, he asked God the Father to forgive those who were doing that. And then he continued to lay down his life for us, dying for our sins. Do good when you face suffering and evil. Number five, seek peace and keep seeking peace. Verse 11, let him seek peace and pursue it. Think about that harmony earlier. That's what peace brings. Peace brings different voices, different people together. The beautiful song. But that harmony doesn't happen naturally. Believers have to pursue it. They have to continue going after it. it this term in here is a hunting term. It means to pursue with intensity, determination, and, perse and perseverance. If you go out hunting, you go up to the edge of the woods and you don't see the deer that you want to shoot right at that moment, do you turn around and go inside? That's how sometimes we approach peace, isn't it? I tried. I, I called them. I left them a message. They haven't got back to me. I guess that's it. No. Hunt for peace. Intently pursue it. Peace takes time. Number six, live in righteousness. Verse 12, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his, eye, his ears are open to their prayers. We often assume when we face evil that we're going to respond well. When we think, okay, if I was in Germany in the 1930s and Hitler started riding to power, I'd tell you what, he wouldn't have made it all the way to the top. I would have done something. <laughs> or in Christian circles we go, if I'm ever arrested for my faith, if I'm ever tortured and, and asked to renounce Christ, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> and yet we leave our gatherings and we go and we do what we want during the week. We live for ourselves. And we think that we're going to be able in that moment to withstand pressure, and torture, and evil. What we need to do is walk daily with Jesus. That's what righteousness is. In order to be primed and ready to respond well when evil and reviling come to our door, we need to be walking in the Spirit daily. We need to walk in the pattern of being conformed to Christ. Our obedience and our worship of Him directs us in our prayers, our study, our love, and our living. Number seven, don't be afraid or anxious. Down in verse 14, have no fear of them, nor be troubled. Again, that evil and reviling is meant to move you out of the situation, to produce fear and anxiety so that you are controlled. And that's how we feel oftentimes when troubles come. We feel out of control, powerless, or weak in light of it. We feel like we have anxiety. When we feel that way, we behave differently. Fight or flight. What are we going to do? Well, Peter tells us what we should do. We should set Christ as our master. Look at verse 15. But in your hearts... Honor Christ the Lord as holy. Set apart Christ as your Lord, as your master. When Jesus is your master, you're set free from having to conform to man's expectations. No longer do you have to try to fit Jesus into everyone else's opinion. But when you see him for who he is, that he is supreme and he is over all, then the control that man has over you, as you follow him, loosens. You realize that you no longer have to be afraid you no longer have to be troubled. Set Christ as master. Number eight, be ready for opportunities to share Jesus. 
Verse 15 continues, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. If you've been around the church for a lot or you've studied evangelism, this is probably a familiar verse to you. To think of the great love that God has given us, the great hope that we have in Christ, the inheritance that we have in Him. Now, looking forward to that, it's a great thing to share. But how about in the light of this context? How about in the light of suffering? We need to think about our suffering. And we need to think about our witness a little bit differently. We need to think about our suffering here. That suffering may be the context where others see life in Jesus most clearly. When we walk through times of suffering, people are watching. Everyone loves to treat well others well when things are going good, but how do we respond to suffering and evil? How do we treat other people who harm us? That's on display. And people will take notice when they see things that are unusual. When you suffer reviling, ridicule, rejection, how you respond in an unusual way will draw attention. We need to see our suffering as an opportunity that God may use to bring people to him. And then we need to be ready with our witnessing. Our witnessing is the good news of Jesus. It's not a sales pitch for a better life. Just add Jesus to your life and everything will be wonderful. The gospel at its heart recognizes that we live in a broken and sinful world where evil and suffering exist. And we have in Christ the answer to that. Not just in this life, but in the life to come. How we respond in those moments tells people not only what is worth living for, but what might even be worth dying for if it comes to that. So be ready with a defense and a reason for your faith. Number nine, be gentle and respectful. Verse 15 continues to do it with gentleness and respect. The manner in which we give that defense, give that reason in the light of suffering. The tone that we have, the words that we say. We can use the gospel to beat people up like a club. Make them feel guilty, then they'll come. We can bring more suffering and trouble on ourselves. We can turn people away by harshness of words. We can miss out on opportunities because we are hard to be with. So to the contrary, we open the door to further opportunities with gentleness, which brings kindness and respect even in the midst of suffering. Number 10, keep your conscience clear. Verse 16 tells us having a good conscience. So that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Our conscience tells us how well we are walking with the Lord as the Spirit advises us. And a clear conscience means we don't have to keep looking back over our shoulder, hoping that the wrongs we have done aren't about to catch up with us. A life of good behavior lived with a clear conscience is a testimony to those around us. St. Francis of Assisi is purported to say some version of this. Preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. First off, let me say, it's necessary. If you're sharing the gospel, you have to use words. It is God's communication to us. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. But a partner with that is the way that we live, with a clear conscience. Do your words match your behavior? Are you coming in with a clear conscience? So instead of responding to evil with evil or reviling with reviling, when we suffer evil and suffering, face suffering and evil, we should choose to do good. So that since seems to put it maybe feeling uncomfortable because that puts us in a vulnerable and precarious position. We could continue to suffer great loss and even ultimately to suffer the loss of our lives, our physical lives. We don't necessarily always see the relief, the end in sight. So why should we keep holding on and do these things? Because God sees and blesses his children for right living. God sees and blesses his children for right living. God sees our suffering. He knows our suffering. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. And there is a reward. There is a blessing that comes along with forsaking ourselves and our way of responding and 
choosing instead to bless. As verse 9 tells us, that we may obtain a blessing. What is this blessing that we are promised? Jesus talked about being blessed in the light of suffering and persecution in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount. At the end of the Beatitudes, he says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For, and here is the blessing, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's the blessing for those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. You inherit the kingdom of heaven. He goes on in the next two verses, in 11 and 12, it says, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utterly and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. That scratched penny is small next to the fortune of the millionaire. Our momentary suffering gives us a reward in heaven, the kingdom of heaven itself. But God also blesses us in this life. One last time, let's look through some of these verses. Verse 10, for whoever desires to love life and see good days, that's a blessing. That's a blessing for those who live according to God's way. Verse 12, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. Do you know that God pays attention to you as you walk rightly in the face of suffering? His ears and his eyes attentive to you. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. The God is on the side of those who are righteous and he is against those who do wrong. There is retribution for those who do evil. And then in verse 17, for it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. We are a part of God's plan, and part of God's plan includes Christians, believers, exiles, his beloved children, going through times of trial, going through times of strengthening, God knows what we're going through, and he has promised in those times to never leave us or forsake us. Jesus died to secure those promises for us. And so our life as believers should look like this. We do good in the face of suffering and evil. We use our words to bless even those who do wrong to us. And we entrust ourselves to God to make things right. James 1.12 says this. Blessed is the man or woman who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. This is good news. I pray that your week this week will not be filled with suffering and evil, with reviling and slander. But if it is, I would encourage you to turn your eyes to the Lord. Look at Jesus' example. Do good. Use your words to bless and walk in righteousness so that his name is glorified and that those who see have their eyes pointed to our beloved Savior. Would you stand with me as we close our service? Father, I don't like suffering. I don't like when people don't even have a really good opinion of me. Especially don't like when people revile or slander or say things against me. But Father, we are called to receive suffering and evil for righteousness sake, for the sake of your name. Would you help us, first of all, to live an innocent life, pursuing you, doing good, and Father, if we run into these situations, would you help us to continue to do good? Would you help us to bless with our words, with our actions? Would you help us to be restored in a relationships where someone has one time done us harm? But because your spirit is at work in us, they have seen something different. They ask a question and we are able to give them a response the hope that we have, not by us, but by your name, by the name of Jesus. We ask, Lord, that you would help us this week. 
Father, I ask that you would stir up people in our congregation that would come alongside of others who are facing suffering and evil to give them the hope that we have in Christ. I pray that this would be true of us as we are unified in heart and mind, that we would do this for each other so that your name is made great and the body of Christ who lives here is known for being people who love even in the midst of hard times. Father, we ask that you would help us this week to draw close to you and experience the joy of being saved, of being rescued and with an inheritance yet to come, a great, great reward. Because of Jesus, all of this is secured for us. And so it's in his name that we ask these things. Amen. Have a wonderful week.